Dagote. The circuit will be our focus for the next few videos. It is a basic microprocessor without control circuitry. It looks intimidating, doesn't it? There certainly are a large number of devices and several nuances to consider, so I'll never say that the circuit is simple. However, it does follow a relatively simple concept, one that was discussed earlier in our Introduction to Registers lesson. In that example, we saw how specific data could be accessed from memory locations, brought to the front end of a calculator called the arithmetic logic unit, and processed through that calculator, in this case added. The result could then be passed back into memory. The lesson plan for these next videos is to first discuss the memory portion and see what devices are used. Then we'll discuss the processor portion. And finally, we'll have a demonstration showing how to run the machine. Keep in mind that I called this a microprocessor without control circuitry. We as humans are serving the role of control, choosing values and flipping switches at the appropriate times to extract the desired data and perform the desired operations. It is a finely detailed job we're given, which means it takes focus, but it allows us to understand how a microprocessor works. The circuit's memory region is in the bottom half. This example uses 4 bits, and so there are a number of 4-bit registers and 4-bit buffers. There are two categories of memory, read-only, ROM, and random access, RAM. Arbitrarily, I chose to have 4 ROM devices and 3 RAM devices, but the layout can easily be expanded to a larger number. There are only two operations we can do with memory, read or write. As its name suggests, read-only memory allows us to read the data from it. We can never write data to it. There are numerous real-world ROM applications, such as video game cartridges, routines for a washing machine, music on a compact disc, or a computer's operating system. In all of these examples, notice how important it is to have that data available so we know what instructions to follow, and how we don't want the ability to delete that data. Typically, ROM data is embedded into hardware. In this circuit, we simulate this with hex keyboards. When I press a button to change the data, imagine this is changing out a video game cartridge. RAM allows us to both read and write. The name random access might sound like the microprocessor can do whatever it wants unpredictably, but that is not the meaning of the name. Here, random means that we can choose any of these registers at any time. Contrast this with data stored in another form, such as a magnetic tape reel or a DVD. In those examples, we must wait until the reel spins around to the correct location before accessing the desired data. How can we choose registers in this circuit? Through the device address decoder. If, for example, I want to choose RAM 5, indicated by this little label here, I press 5 on the keyboard. The decoder will output high only on this specific line, which allows RAM 5 to possibly be enabled. I say possibly because another condition needs to be met. In order to write data to RAM 5, I must activate write mode by flipping the switch high. Now is the special case where this register is enabled. Meanwhile, all of these other ROM and RAM registers are unenabled. Why is this so important? Because every one of them connects to the data bus. The data bus simply contains wires, and those wires can only hold one logical value at a time, either true or false. If multiple registers have access to the data bus, there is a conflict. The device that prevents these data conflicts is a buffer. Notice how every one of the ROM or RAM registers has a buffer between it and the data bus. The internal circuit of these 4-bit buffers is quite simple. Each input bit feeds to an output bit, with only a tri-state buffer in between. 
If there is a low value on this enable port, the bit passes through unchanged. But if there is a high value, that signal is cut off. The output holds neither a true or a false, but instead is in a state of high impedance, which is exactly what we want to prevent a downstream data conflict. This NAND gate at the bottom ensures that the buffer allows data to pass through only if both of these enable signals are high. The same idea could be achieved with a single enable input, but the double input allows flexibility for requiring multiple triggers. As we see in our microprocessor, this comes in handy. This buffer can only be enabled if both read mode is activated and this particular device's address is selected. This wraps up our introduction to memory. The big ideas are the differences between RAM and ROM, the use of buffers to serve as gatekeepers for the data bus, and the device select allowing us to choose one specific memory address. In the next video, we will discuss the processor unit and its ALU heart.